Hello. Uh, my name's Dan. I haven't actually done a presentation like this before. Um, and I actually really don't enjoy public speaking because I do this thing where I forget to breathe and then pass out. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, but I'm sure everything will be fine. Um, I was trying to think, I know the title said visualisation and business because Becky asked for it over WhatsApp. I couldn't think of anything better to say, so I sent it. Um, but actually, what I'm going to try and do today is explain a little bit about what we do without going into too much detail, but also my journey from in my bedroom to uh, starting the business and having some guys kind of working around me, which is great, uh, and also talk about how you guys can leverage like the clients we work with. So there's a lot of um, weaknesses in their businesses that can be exploited by people who work in marketing. It's probably a nicer way of saying that. Um, but basically there are a lot of opportunities there and I think hopefully I can kind of illustrate those to you and you can maybe um, sort of leverage them yourselves. So <clears throat> basically all I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about us, uh, about Dirty. I'm going to talk a bit about our clients and the challenges they face and how you guys can leverage these as opportunities. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a case study that kind of illustrates some of those facts. So who are we? We're Dirty. I'm Dirty. I've got two guys who work with me. Um, we're a technical content creation agency, which I think is the best way I could describe what we do. Uh, we end up doing a lot of stuff for our clients, but primarily we use uh, some very advanced software um, and techniques to create really cool videos and interactive experiences for them, which could be on iPads, could be VR, could be videos, could work on websites, could be on show stands. Uh, that's kind of the stuff that we do. We're based in Maidstone, um, obviously, in Kent. Um, we are established in 2016 as a limited company, I'll go on to that in a minute, so we're nearly three years old um, and there's three of us um, as employees of Dirty, we work in an office of seven people so it's like a shared kind of environment, we've got a nice kind of office and we've got some other kind of designers and people that can support our business which is great, um, so they're individual businesses themselves or freelancers but we all kind of work together which is a really nice environment, it seems to be the way things are going. So we solve problems and we implement technical content strategies for our clients. <clears throat> this is a little video which is just going to run through a few of the projects and bits and pieces that we've done recently. Thank you for the whole minute of time you spent watching that. Um, so that's a brief uh, overview there of some of the projects we've done. Um, a lot of the work that we did when we were starting out was white label, so we can't talk about it, but those are some projects that we can speak about. So how did we get here? How did I get here? Um, so I started that, as I said, in 2016, after a year as working as a sole trader. Um, I put those air quotes in because I spent most of that time building a motorbike and I got a puppy and got married and didn't really do a huge amount, if I'm honest, <laughs> in terms of growing my business. Um, but I was doing a lot of um, branding and web development work and consultancy. Um, that was kind of what I was doing. I wasn't doing any kind of CGI or 3D at that point. And I was like, you know, I left my job because I got sick of working for people when I didn't really believe in uh, the company and I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So I wanted to make cool stuff. I wanted to love going to work every day. I wanted to have a healthy life balance as well. Um, so I started uh, as a limited company um, and I started in the business, well actually originally I started in my bedroom <laughs> and then I moved to the business terrace, uh, which was just over in Maidstone, uh, just down the road in, K in King Street. Um, and I took a, de a hot desk space and I did more work on this hot desk in a week <laughs> than I did in like two months at home. So they said, oh, we've got a three-person office come available. And I thought, well, I've only just committed to like a 50-pound desk. You know, do I want to go to a whole office? It's 10 times the cost. Um, 
but I did it and I, I brought a guy on board who actually worked at a picture framing stall in, uh, in Framing Walk. <laughs> um, and I put this job advert out and he came back and he was like, I love zombies and <laughs> I love games and I really want to do this job, like please give me a chance. And I just thought, you know, he's a great guy. Came on board, um, trained him up obviously um, and obviously recently took on uh, Terry who's joined this year. Uh, say hi Terry. Um, and Terry's obviously helping out with a bit of account management, but primarily it's supposed to be digital marketing and helping us to push the business out there, which is something we've never done. So why did we move into like this technical marketing sector? It's obviously a bit of a complicated area. Um, first of all, nobody's really doing it that I could see, not in Kent, not in the southeast. I, I struggled to see any big names. There were people that did bits and pieces, loads of people in London, but nobody in Kent. Um, so obviously nobody was doing it, but the downside was it's very expensive. So <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do. I looked at these videos. I thought, wow, these videos are amazing. Um, I didn't know how to do them. I didn't have the equipment to do them, all the software. I didn't, I didn't have anything. So I knew it was going to be expensive to get there. Um, and basically, what I did was just started, obviously, on my own and then grew the team very slowly and gradually to bring um, the PCs and everything uh, in-house. And my motto has always been do more with less. So clients that we deal with aren't fussed that we're not a 20-person agency or a 15-person agency because they don't have to spend 50 grand for their project. They can spend, you know, a tenth of that. Um, they're really interested that you know their problems and you can solve their problems. And I'm going to come on to that in a bit. So I don't feel like I needed a lot of stuff to try and impress these guys. We just needed to go in and, and have the right mindset, basically. <clears throat> so the challenges were big clients need convincing and educating. So I sat in my bedroom with nothing <laughs> to show them, thinking, I want to work with that client. I've got no way of doing it. Um, so what I started doing was working with, um, we needed to build a portfolio or I needed to build a portfolio of work. And I thought the easiest way to do that, I don't have the time to manage the clients, I don't have the time to go and do all of that stuff. So I started working on a white label basis, basis with agencies. So I spoke to agency people that I already knew and said, look, I want to do this stuff. And they were like, oh, we've got clients we can talk to, they might be interested in that. We'd go in and I basically just sell it so low, at so low a cost, sorry, they couldn't say no. Um, we would get the work, uh, I would get the work and the agency would get the work and I'd have to basically figure out how to do it. Obviously, the client wasn't overly fussed, they had very low expectations. I got to learn the stuff and I did build a portfolio, but I couldn't share it because it was white label. Um, so the first kind of two years, I would say, primarily most of the work we were doing was white label and it wasn't 3D work, it was a bit of website work and consultancy. I went to one client, they were like, our printer's broken, can you, can you take a look? I was like, yeah, all right. Um, you know, so it was a little bit of everything, to be honest. It took time to get to the stage that we're at. So I lowered the cost to get in the door and then built the accounts like, over time, direct relationships with the client, tried to get in as senior as possible, tried to get in at like, the, the managing director or CEO, the guy who ran the business and understand why they're running the business, why are you doing this, how can, how can I do stuff that's gonna help you? Um, because you know, your marketing managers and directors and account executives, those guys leave the business. The managing director doesn't leave the business. If you can get in well with him, you're sorted. So, or her, sorry, him or her, sorry, you're sorted. Um, so, um, retainers, was a, was a, we bought a retainer client on last year, which was great for the business, because I thought, fine, I don't have to worry about paying my mortgage every month. Um, but actually, it's great because it helps with cash flow. So retainers are where you obviously agree to a fixed sum of work over a period of time. You, you can, you can, it's a, it's a, a blessing because obviously you don't have to worry about money, but the curse is that client like owns you. <laughs> they want, they want you to do everything for them. You are their one sole priority. And that has meant, obviously we've done some fantastic work and actually it's kindly the case that I'll show you at the end that we're, we're on retainer with, but it's a good point to make. It can be a curse. It was a lot of money to get everything done legally to get in the door. And it obviously has paid dividends in the long term, but has been very difficult to manage other business. And basically what's happened is all the business that we were getting before, well, like Kinley was down here and other businesses here, as I has risen, all the other businesses have dropped off because I haven't had the time to go out and do everything else. I've been so busy focused on this account. So if you're gonna get onto retainer, it's a great way to do it, but just be aware of that, um, being realistic and managing expectations. Um, we need to revamp our website and everything. I have been saying it for ages. <laughs> I promised Terry, Terry we'd do it in January, it's still not been done. Um, so, uh, so don't look at all of our stuff too much, too closely, because it's a bit mucky online. Um, we're going to have a revamp and launch everything out. So follow us on social media and you'll see all the good stuff come out over the next few months. So talking a little bit about our clients, um, we work with clients in engineering, manufacturing, construction in the built environment, medical and automotive. For the purposes of today, because it's our largest client base, I'm going to talk about engineering and manufacturing, which sounds very boring. 
but it's not. I think this covers an enormous range of clients and there's a huge amount of potential work there um, because they are very weak in terms of communication, c communicating their uh, products and their solutions. They're very weak in terms of even understanding within their own business what they do. So many of them are regional businesses, so they're headquartered in Europe or the States. And they've just got this UK team that you know, has very limited control over their marketing, but they need to you know, market to the entire of Europe, for example. So some great opportunities there. So the challenges these guys face, at the minute, there's a lot of rapid prototype development. So what's happening is because technology is moving so fast, and I'm going to use uh, logistics as an example for this. <clears throat> so for example, with logistics, there's a, a huge movement to automated logistics. So for Amazon to get a package to your door, the sheer amount of work that needs to happen, that needs to take place for that to happen is phenomenal. So from the second that you're actually uh, using the app and you've, you're looking at a product and you've added it to your basket, a little bot Amazon has already put that package in a tote. It's already started picking it before you've even gone through the checkout. Because odds are if you've picked that product and you're going to order it, even if you don't, somebody else is. So they've got an enormous amount of technology that's running to achieve all of these goals. And because it's moving so quickly, a lot of the subsidiary companies that sell to Amazon, obviously Amazon don't manufacture their own equipment, they buy other people's equipment. Those guys have to prototype so fast to get in the door at these companies, it's phenomenal. Um, so they have to come up with ideas and visualize these products before they've even had a chance to test them or even build them. Um, so that's where we come in, obviously, is help them to visualize something that they've made in their minds that doesn't actually exist in real life yet. <clears throat> They're obviously struggling with cost-focused procurement. So obviously everybody's doing very similar stuff and everyone's getting beaten with a stick because <laughs> they want to pay less money. There are so many suppliers that can do the same thing and everybody has to try and, um, try and help, with, help to meet those costs. Um, and there's a lack of internal knowledge and coherency, which I think is widely not spoken about, but is present in every single client that we've dealt with, especially the bigger clients. They, in their own teams, even the UK sales guys don't know their product. They don't know what they're selling. So it's useless talking to them to try and get the information about you know, what you should put in the video because they don't even know it themselves. And you don't find that out till halfway through the project when you speak to someone who does know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so these are all uh, challenges. Um, so what they need to do, they need to inspire stakeholders. So the people who like pretty things but don't necessarily understand the ins and outs of it just have to be inspired to get them in the door. They need to convince the guys who are spending the money that it's a worthwhile long-term investment. So although a product may be expensive up front, actually it's going to save you 10 times that cost over its life cycle or it will allow you to expand your system and they have to enable installers. So the guys that actually then go and fit that equipment and actually physically install it, what are their, what are their materials? That, you know, are they looking at a manual? Are they reading an app to understand how to do it? Are they watching a video? They need materials that cover all of these, all of these bases. So this represents obviously a huge opportunity for us, for you. Um, and what we found with our clients, these are kind of uh, the big things that I've noticed. Um, they all want a reliable partner through the freelancer revolution. So a lot of them are working with Freelancers, they're happy to. The people that are actually in the marketing department don't necessarily want to speak to um, a big agency because that big agency can't possibly do everything they need. You know, they need CGI, they need VR, they need um, filming, they need a microsite and an ad campaign, they need SEO. It's very difficult to find one person that can supply all of that stuff and can do it well. So they're happy to use freelancers, but then the next challenge for them is you've got one marketing manager who's trying to handle a whole bunch of freelancers. So what we do is we go in and we basically say we're a partner to work with you and we do this animation and we usually end up getting involved in the other aspects of the, uh, of the bits and pieces as well. And we then lean on freelancers and we're very open about that. We say, you know, I've got three guys that do filming. They're all great, but this guy's a perfect match for you because of X, Y, Z. We've got Adrian who's in the room who does CAD. Um, you know, we don't do CAD ourselves. We need SolidWorks. We go to Adrian. We've got this kind of network around us and as long as you understand their product, they're very comfortable to give you control and give you leverage over that. So you don't, I don't think anybody needs to feel too small. If you go in there and you speak to a client, you know, regardless of the size of the project or the account, you can win it if you can basically prove that you can do that work. So trust and knowledge are key. Um, and my mantra is just take the time to understand the client, just ask questions, probe them. You know, where do you make money? What is your best sale to date? What, you know, what was the best client that you spoke to? Um, we try and write, run some focus workshops because we find that marketing is just completely disconnected from the business and is usually sitting so close to the CEO and MD that it's very far away from its actual clients. So we'll say, right, can we speak to your installers, the sales guys, the people that actually deal with the projects and have to answer the same questions every day? You know, if we could, if we could make a video which answered the question that 20 of your sales guys are answering every single day and they just send a video, surely that's going to save you some time. So we ask the right questions, we try and pull as much information as we can and we challenge them on what they've asked for. They go, we want this thing. 
we go, that's great, but actually that thing isn't going to help you with all this stuff that you need. Um, and actually, how can we take this project that you've got and break it up into multiple smaller things that you're going to get more value from it than just the one thing you're doing? So let's say you were going to do a video. You could spend three grand and get a video that has one use, or you could spend 5K and you get a video that can be split into four other videos that could be used on social. So we want to produce useful materials for them which are cost efficient, targetable, and memorable. So I'll speak about that basically in the case study that I'm about to go through. I don't know how fast I'm going. <laughs> I kind of feel like I've rattled through all of it and we're barely, <laughs> barely there. Um, so this is a client that we I basically brought on board last year and we uh, landed with them for a retainer, which was great. Um, but it started out as just a LinkedIn post and I just happened to be browsing LinkedIn one day and somebody that I knew had commented on a post of somebody who was looking for a, for a 3D animator. So they weren't, even, uh, they weren't even mentioning me, I just saw, saw the post. I noticed they were all about two weeks old. I thought, I'm too late to the game. But I put my comment in there anyway, and it just sort of niggled me. And I thought, Do you know, I've never done this before. But I'm just going to pick the phone up. And I just picked the phone up, and I called the guy. And I just said, um, he was obviously a very busy man. I happened to get hold of him. I just said, look, I've seen this post, and I've commented on it. I've probably missed out. He said, you have missed out. We've got, uh, we've got another agency that are already doing uh, the CGIs, but it's been two weeks. They promised us these seven images, and they haven't done a single one. So I said, fine, send it over to me. I'll get you an image over by the end of the day and I won't even charge you for it. He said, fine. So we sent it over and we did it and we got in there. He said, right, come down, let's have a chat. So we did. Then we pinched all the work from the other agency, <laughs> shamelessly. Um, and and I, st I started talking to him and, and he said, you know, I want to do all these things. This is my vision for our product that we've got. Um, you know, we've got all these disparate things that we've created and need to collect them together. I want to have one uniform campaign that I can go out and I can sell it as a solution. So I said, right, if you want to do that, rather than us making an image of one product, we need to come up with an entire scene, a whole layout of all of your products, like feature everything in there, every challenge that engineers come over, everything that, that you can possibly do, put it in one scene, let's make it. Once we've made it, we can make as many videos as you want from it. <clears throat> it took a lot of negotiation because, you know, he got me in there for one image and I was trying to pitch him a massive retainer. <laughs> it was like pretty much our annual turnover in one hit. <laughs> and... Uh, and it took a lot of negotiation. I had to pay a load of money to get all the contracts in place and everything. Um, but we did manage uh, to, to get it all signed off, um, six month term, and we engaged with them. And I literally just tore their products to pieces. So went in, met the teams, spoke to the people that installed it and all of, all of the um, ancillary products and just said, right, rip it all to pieces. Let's start, let's start over. What are your problems? What do you want to do? Um, and basically what we've done so far today inside the retainer, we delivered two major campaigns um, or one's about to go live and we've delivered one already so the first was what they call their hero product uh, which is this aluminium edging which is going to mean nothing to you guys but it basically sits between uh, grass or a soft landscape and a hard landscape like a pavement and it basically means that they can install this boundary very very quickly so it's a key product for them they've been selling it for years it's kind of the thing that they make the most of their revenue on but they felt it was a bit unloved it hadn't had a lot of attention um, and they said, we want to redo the images for this. Um, and I said, look, let's run a whole campaign. And the marketing manager loved it, loved the idea. She was like, great, I want to do it all. I want to get it all done. I want to launch a new campaign in three weeks. And I was just like, okay, I'm sure, I'm sure we can manage it. Um, so we built them a microsite. Um, so one of the key things here is what I find with these clients, they focus so heavily on their products. That's what they focus on. This is my product. This is what I do. That's it. They don't think about their clients. The clients actually don't really care about their products. The clients care about a solution. So what I said to them was, your product's um, very confusing. I don't understand it. You've got eight products here that you've shown me in this booklet, and I can't tell the difference between them. It, and if I can't do it, surely your clients can. They're like, no, love you, Dan. Don't, no, don't, you know, I'm not buying into that. We've been selling it for years. It's absolutely fine. And I just thought, do you know what? No, I'm going to do it. So we, we came up with this idea for a product selector widget, um, and we put it on this microsite which is a one-page website we built in WordPress, basically, uh, I'll show it to you in a minute, um, built it very quickly. Uh, we put a video on there that we'd produced and a couple of CGIs, um, and they loved it, and they put it live. And they saw in the, in the same month, so put it live in January, by end of February, February had showed an 80% uplift in sales versus the previous year, so a massive increase, um, obviously, in, in sales. But the interesting thing was when we looked, when Terry looked at the, um, at the metrics for this microsite, um, 80, over 80% 80 of the people that were hitting that site were using the calculator. And actually most of them were using the calculator then buggering off. So it was a very clear need that they, they needed a calculator, a selector for their products because their clients didn't understand how it worked. <clears throat> so what actually started to happen was the microsite started ranking above their website. 
even though we put it uh, alive for a month and we didn't do any SEO, well, other than the market, the um, email campaign, didn't do any SEO around it. Um, so they said, right, now this is a problem. Suddenly everyone's going to the microsite rather than the main website. Um, so they then started beating their web agency with a stick and going, you need to make all this stuff that these guys have made and put it in the website because, so I got an angry call from their MD going, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so look, I'm really sorry, it's not my fault. Um, we just made this thing and it's taken off. Um, so we shared everything with them and obviously in time they, uh, they're implementing it on the website. So I'll show you that website in a minute. Uh, the second project that we did was just massive and nearly killed both Adrian and myself. It was just enormous. Um, and this was where I said I wanted to sell the entire product range in one hit. So it was a huge amount of work. And then unfortunately their lead 3D guy um, on their side, the CAD guy, uh, fell ill and was taken off the project, you know, literally a week in. Um, hence why Adrian came on board and helped out. Anyway, we got through it all and we produced a video and from there we're looking to make a configurator that's going to go into their new showroom. So they've just opened a three-bay showroom in Farringdon in London, Clerkenwell, the design district, and they have all their products obviously on the walls and bits and pieces that you can see, but they can't show every variation of every product. And using the scene that we've got, they can. So we're going to build that into something they can use on an iPad or with VR headset. They can actually see, like, what does that look like if I change that colour or move that product over there or... You know, they can actually interact with it. And it's a very powerful tool for them because the people they're dealing with fall into the first tier of uh, people that I mentioned, um, these stakeholders. You know, if they can't see it, if they don't understand it, they're never going to specify it because they can't fit it into their, into their design. Anyway, there you go. So <laughs> I've gone through that really quick. <laughs> um, that's pretty much uh, the two case studies. And I'm going to just show you quickly if I've got time. I think I've got time. Um, the, uh, the two that I've got, and I'll just come back to this slide in a minute, so obviously you can ask any questions you might have. And now it's died for me. So this one here, I'm just going to biggerize this. So <clears throat> this was their, edging looks tiny on that screen. Uh, this was their edging campaign. And um, so we've got the video up here. And we've got a nice kind of interactive slider thing down here where you can sort of see how the product works or one of the products. Uh, some call to actions. And this is the little calculator that we made, which is basically a questionnaire um, plugin for WordPress. Um, and we, they gave us this A3 sheet, saluted like the size of this TV with this ridiculous flow chart of all the questions you'd need to ask to specify the product. And I was like, no, I bet you can do this in three questions. They're like, there's no way you can you can you can't specify products in three questions. So I did, and <laughs> so you'll be fine. Uh, and so that's what we built. We basically scaled it right down to make it simple, and we put it on the website. And this little box here is what 80% of the people that have come to this website have used. <coughs> and then we've obviously well. So the issue here is they can't because. The, their website doesn't have any uh, metrics in terms of conversion. They don't know who's in the website. They only know that they've got calls. But they've said quite openly that, um, you know, that their product's basically been doing this until February when it just went through the roof. <laughs> so they're pretty confident that given they haven't been running any other marketing or anything at all, this is all they did, um, that it's quite, you know, it's probably because they've done this, this kind of stuff. So... I mean, that sounds like I'm bigging up way bigger than it is, but I think the, the point to take away here is that, you know, this, if somebody said to me, I want you to build me a one-page website and put a little, you know, quiz widget on there, that wasn't what came out of the discussions originally. What came out of the discussions originally was, I want a marketing campaign. This is the problem I need to solve. We're not making enough sales. And it was us that had to come back with this. And, you know, it's not even really what we do. We've just added it on, and it's obviously worked out very well for them. But I think a really good example for the guys in the room, obviously, of how you can approach things slightly differently, hopefully. Um, so that's a website. I won't go through all of it in detail, but you can see they've got all these products and it, it really isn't clear, um, you know, which one is for which purpose. Um, so we've just tried to do that uh, with, this, with this material. And obviously, we've put a little video in there, which I won't bore you with because it's a bit boring. Um, and I think I've got here... Uh, how long is that? It's three minutes. If you get bored, I'll stop it. Um, so this was the kind of main video. Oh, there we go. So we worked with the landscape architect to produce, you know, there's actually a really good point, so I'm going to pause it and talk to you about it. 
I'll show pause it on a nice thing. Can't remember if it's something pretty. There you go. That looks pretty. Um, so we spoke to the architect, and the architect said, oh, this is great. You can make anything. I said, yeah. She was like, it just blows my mind. So she came down to the office and looked at the guys working on the screen, and she said, you know the one thing that lets, always lets CGI's down for, our, for outdoor landscape architecture? I said, is the plants. They're never realistic. They just stick a load of ferns in a corner, or they Photoshop something in, and that's it. But it's never the right season. It's never the right plant. And anybody looking at this stuff will know. Will know that it's not the right plants. Will know it's the right, not the right thing. So I said, fine, okay, well, what plants we, you know, it's only a plant, it can't be that difficult, what do you need? <laughs> <coughs> Which was just a mistake, because she just went mad, and she was like, right, and she gave me this spreadsheet of plants and their flowering dates and Latin names and which versions would be in Europe, and I was like, this is just a mistake. Um, and poor Sean in the office had to sit there with all these reference materials <laughs> and make these plants literally petal by petal, leaf by leaf, had to manufacture something that looked realistic and you know truth be told we spent way more time on the plants than we spent on anything else um but when you see the shots when you know the people that see this always comment on the flowers they go it just looks it looks so real and the reason it looks real is because you know the plants are in there making each of the leaves you know animate with the wind all this sort of stuff it was a huge amount of work that was never in scope when i even hinted at the fact that it might cost a third as much of it did uh, as it did they were like no we're not spending that money so i was like okay well we'll just do it for free then um so yeah, so there you go, that, which is why you can see kind of these petals and things moving in the in this shot here, for example. It's actually a lot of work, but <laughs> whatever. We know that some of the common challenges faced are construction build heights, materials, waterproofing, weight limits, to name a few. To overcome these challenges, we've developed the Kingly Terrace system. This so this is another issue where clients want to show everything that their products can do, um, and it's very, it's very challenging for them to do that without using something like this, where the person that's seeing the video can understand it's one product on screen, I can see that, and it's actually changing to suit the needs. With the use of Kinley's pedestals and joists, you can create a variety of complex decking and tile layouts. Our pedestals are available in a range of height profiles, which allow for shallow build-up. You can even install on sloping or uneven surfaces. The terrace system is simple and fast to install, with minimal fixings required. Pedestals simply sit directly on a waterproof membrane or insulation layer. Raft aluminium joists are laid on top, and the connector gears are twisted to lock them in place. So as a further upsell from this, not only can we do the interactive stuff, i.e. we can produce more videos that talk specifically about individual things you see here, um, but we've even done an installation guide for these products because we've got it all now. So we built it and it was an easy upsell for us to then go, you know what, you could do, a, you could do an installation guide from here and it would only take us a few days to do. Um, so yeah, if you want to let me play, <laughs> play the whole thing out, but uh, yeah, there's like three minutes of this, so I'm not going to put you through it. <laughs> So we've got these nice kind of beauty shots at the end here, which I'll show you. The Kinley Terrace system gives you true flexibility in designing for private residential, commercial, and public outdoor spaces. The Kinley team is this is stock footage again. No one likes having their own staff in the, sh in the shots in case they leave. So we've just got a generic guy sat at a computer. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, can you get someone? some orange in the background. I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll see what we can do. Um, right, so there you go. Has anybody got any questions that they want to ask? <laughs>